This video is about freedom, which is one of the central concepts for the existentialist, so it's important that we understand what they have in mind by freedom and why they think freedom is so important and what kind of impact it has on human life so that we can understand the basic existentialist perspective on things. So you can see our agenda here in the bottom left. We're going to start off with just an overview of freedom, what it is and how it links up to subjectivity, which is another important existentialist idea. Second, we're going to move on to the worry about determinism and whether this blocks our freedom in some sort of way. Third, we're going to move on to the worry about being in jail or being a slave or some other circumstance like this and whether this presents some limitation on our freedom. And then fourth, we're going to talk about what the implications of this kind of freedom are according to the existentialist. And for all of this, this is going to be sort of the broad existentialist picture. It's also one that Sartre endorses. Sartre, like all existentialists, has a more a specific view on these sorts of things. So beyond the general things I'll be saying, he's got his own theory of freedom with lots and lots of details. We're not going to get into that too much, especially because he doesn't get into that too much in the reading that we've done. So we're just going to go over uh, the things he covers in the reading, basically. So starting off just, what is freedom? What's the basic idea of freedom or free will for the existentialist? And the thought is that it's basically uh, the normal understanding of it or the normal meaning of the term in English. So uh, being able to make choices, uh, being unencumbered, not being limited in what you're able to do, things like this. This is the freedom that the existentialist has in mind. And what's interesting about the existentialist approach to freedom is that they think we sort of have quite a bit of it. We have basically uh, complete freedom. We have utter freedom. Sometimes it's called radical freedom. Uh, we have an incredible amount of freedom, basically Everything in your life is entirely up to your freedom. You have the freedom to determine effectively everything that goes on. And what this means is that uh, ultimately there are sort of no interesting limitations in existentialism except the ones that you impose on yourself. So although, you know, a naive picture of life might be one according to which there's lots of things holding us back and lots of things making us less free and things that sort of limit my freedom, the existentialist idea is, no, anything that you sort of take to be a limit on your freedom, that's ultimately something that's self-imposed. And this is where freedom links up to subjectivity, which is another big topic in existentialism, which will be the focus of another video. The thought is that uh, really any limits on your freedom are subjective limits on your freedom. They're limits that you are imposing on your own freedom. What this means is that since it's sort of up to you whether to limit your freedom or not, uh, if you want, you could sort of be entirely uh, free. So it's not like you have to impose any limits on yourself. You're free to impose limits on yourself or not impose limits on yourself. And the general existentialist thought is that uh, it's sort of uh, un, uh, not unwise, but um, inauthentic to act as if you are not free. You may think you're not free. You may think there are sort of impositions on you from the outside. But in reality, those are impositions you're placing on yourself. So it's sort of on you if you think you are not free, sort of do what you want to do, make the choices that you want to make. So the thought is that uh, for the existentialist, freedom is nothing special or nothing too theoretical. It's just sort of making your own choices, not being limited. But what is special for the existentialist is that they're so sort of serious about freedom. They think it's a massive amount of freedom for human beings. Human beings are interesting in that we are these creatures that are sort of utterly free. We create ourselves entirely out of our freedom. So you might think, okay, well, that's an interesting sort of idea, but how can we possibly be free like this? We live in a deterministic universe where sort of everything that happens happens according to the laws of nature. So how can I be free to break the laws of nature? And in fact, if you think about it, because sort of all my choices and everything going on in my brain, that all obeys the laws of nature. So all the atoms in my brain are following all the physical laws of nature, uh, maybe I actually don't have any freedom at all. Maybe I'm just a robot following the laws of nature. Back when the Big Bang happened, all the particles started moving around according to the laws of nature. That's still happening in me right now. So I don't make any choices at all. So this is a sort of challenge to the kind of freedom that the existentialist endorses. And we're gonna look at two kinds of response to this challenge. So we're in part two of the video, what about determinism? So if we go to page 29, uh, Sartre mentions this a little bit. Uh, he says, in other words, there is no determinism. Man is free. Man is freedom. The thought is determinism is not a worry for the existentialist. And there's kind of two sorts of responses you can imagine the existentialist giving. 
So the first sort of response is that although I just described this puzzle about determinism and free will, not all philosophers think this is a puzzle. A lot of philosophers think determinism is not a challenge for free will. And we could go more into this. The two main options are reject determinism or say that determinism is compatible with free will. Uh, the reason we're not going to talk about those two options in this video is that this is going to be the last unit in the class. Once we finish existentialism and once we finish whatever comes next, uh, we're going to look at free will. So we'll do a lot of investigation into these kinds of answers. So some philosophers think determinism not a worry, uh, and we'll see those arguments much later in the class. But then there's a second reply that's sort of specific to the existentialists that they can give. And this is sort of reply number uh, 2.2 in the outline, do you feel determined? The thought is that, uh, you know, whatever science ostensibly tells us or whatever like you say about determinism or something, surely nobody sort of actually lives their lives like this. Or if they live their lives like this, thinking of themselves as a robot, this is a choice that they've made to live their lives like this. They've convinced themselves that they should live like this, and now they're purposefully acting as if they're a robot controlled by the laws of nature. But honestly, we don't even get that far. Like, nobody acts like a robot who's just determined by the laws of nature. No matter what you think about science or whatever, what you think when you make your choices, when you live your life, is that you are in charge. What it feels like to be a human being is to feel like you're in charge of your own choices. You're making your own destiny. You're making your own free choices. So. Even the idea that we should believe in determinism and believe that it wipes out free will, to choose to believe that, that's a choice. It doesn't just happen to you. It doesn't come from outside and hit you on the head. You sit down and think about it and decide, oh, I don't actually have free will. And Sartre and the existentialists say, that's on you. That's your decision. You have made that subjective choice to believe that you do not have free will. And so, of course, if you're making the choice, then that's just the... Um, age-old existentialist response to this, which is, well, look, you're choosing to act in this sort of way. What I'm saying is you have the freedom to do this. Is this a good choice? Well, no, probably not. It's not a very authentic choice to pretend that you don't have freedom when clearly you do, but no, that's a choice you can make. So those are the two answers the existentialist can give to determinism. Number one, kind of a question mark right now because we'll study it when we get to free will. Number two, Look, whatever we say about determinism, you're choosing whether to believe that or not. You're choosing whether to live your life like you're not free or not. So that's the response. And then you might think, okay, well, forget this metaphysical stuff about determinism. Here's a case where I don't think I'm free. Uh, the government throws me in jail or I'm enslaved somehow. So I'm a slave. I don't have any choices. My master tells me what to do. How can I be free there? So let's go to page 42, see what the existentialists say about this. So, um, historical, so let's look here. So, um, yeah, let's start at the beginning of the paragraph. Furthermore, although it's impossible to find in every man a universal essence, let's actually move over a bit, that could be said to comprise human nature, there is nonetheless a universal human condition. It is no accident that today's thinkers are more likely to speak of the condition of man rather than of his nature. By condition, they refer, more or less clearly, to all limitations that a priori define man's fundamental situation in the universe. So the thought is, well, there are such things as conditions, and conditions sort of define your situation in the universe. There are specifically limitations that define your situation in the universe. Historical situations vary. A man may be born a slave in a pagan society, or a feudal lord or a member of the proletariat. What never varies is the necessity for him to be in the world, to work in it, to live out his life in it among others, and eventually to die in it. These limitations are neither subjective nor objective. Rather, they have an objective as well as a subjective dimension. Objective, because they affect everyone and are evident everywhere. Subjective, because they are experienced and are meaningless if man does not experience them. That is to say, if man does not freely determine himself and his existence in relation to them. So the thought is that the fact that you're a slave, the fact that you're in jail, the fact that any, anything about you, that's true. There is this sort of objective truth out there that like something is going on in your life. So the existentialist does not deny this. Uh, we'll talk about this in the subjectivity video, but the thought is that, of course, you know, there are some limitations on you. Maybe you're locked up in chains or something. We're not denying that. But what do these mean? Does it matter that you're locked up in chains? Does it matter that you're a slave? What sort of impact does this have on your life? 
as Sartre puts it, does it have meaning? Is it meaningless or does it mean anything? And the answer is, well, if it means anything, it's because that's how you're, you're experiencing it in a certain way. So it's meaning something to you. You're incorporating it into your life in some manner. And so for it to matter that you are a slave or for it to matter that you're locked up in jail, you have to sort of react to it or you have to treat it in a certain way. You have to incorporate it into your life and give it meaning. Nothing, in fact, has meaning in the world except insofar as we incorporate it into our lives. That's the sort of lesson behind existence precedes essence. Uh, our existence precedes our essence. What sort of what our life means or what matters to us is determined by how we live and the choices we make. So the thought is that, look, whether you're locked up, or you're a slave or anything, that's meaningless. What's meaningful is what you make of it, how you react to it in your life, what sort of ways you live. And so for the existentialist, the thought is you're not less free by being a slave. You're not less free by being locked up in jail. You're less free if you react in certain ways, sort of. I mean, ultimately, you're free no matter what. You might think you're less free and thus act in certain ways on the basis of that. But the thought is for anything to be meaningful at all, you have to uh, incorporate it into your life in a certain way. And you always have a choice about how to incorporate something into your life, how to live the life that you've ended up in. So the thought is, look, it's true there's sort of an objective thing that looks like unfreedom of being locked in jail or being a slave or something, but ultimately what matters is how it's meaningful, and its meaning depends on how you incorporate it into your life, and that is a free choice you make. So that brings us to section four, sort of what now? What do we do with this freedom? What does all this freedom mean? One thing you'll see when you read the de Beauvoir readings is that she thinks that this freedom is the basis for morality, we also saw this a bit in Sartre already. He says, when you choose for yourself, you choose for others. So the thought is the fact that you have the ability to sort of freely choose how to act can be used to construct a theory of morality. So that's one interesting thing. Another interesting thing is just that it is a kind of radical position to take on life, that we have sort of ultimate freedom, that everything is down to our freedom, that nothing depends on anything outside of us. Everything is sort of inside of us. It's down to the choices we make. So in this way, uh, freedom links up to the subjectivity that, again, we'll talk about later. And um, those, I think, are the main topics. So we can get morality out of freedom, and it's just kind of a radical position on freedom, and that's the existentialist view. Oops. <laughs>